Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, uh, online debate of the Florence School of Regulation. Uh, we are going to discuss today uh, a very interesting, timely topic, uh, carbon capture and storage. Not a new topic for those of you who have been in the sector for a, a few years, but it's also true that uh, we know that the Commission is now working towards a strategy on CCUS to be released probably during the spring. So today we want to discuss what is actually the regulatory framework that could apply in the future to uh, CCUS in particular when it comes to CCS infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, fantastic uh, speakers today. Um, I'm just uh, going to remind you what the, our rules are for this type of online debates. Please do not hesitate to interact with us and with our speakers by using the Q&A uh, chat box that you see here um, underneath our speaking heads. Uh, and um, if there is a little bit of echo that hope can be fixed. Um, and uh, we will also have another way of interacting with you that is through some polls that we have prepared. So be ready. And uh, now I will give the floor to my colleague and scientific organizer of this debate, Andres Pibox. Well, welcome everybody and happy new year. All the best wishes to you and also for the world and for Europe and this year. Let's hope that 2024 will be changing year for many different things, including also climate actions. Because from last year, COP28, and also all the discussion around Fit for 55 went reasonably well. And uh, it seems that during this year, we have a bit easier uh, legislative pressure, but we have a huge challenge in front of us related to CCS. Uh, because uh, usually strategies are coming out at the beginning of the mandate. And this is actually, for this commission, it's the end of the mandate. And the reason is very clear that the political hurdles have been taken only recently. And it's very clear understanding in Europe that CCS is a part of the winning game to achieve a net uh, zero emission by 2050. Saying said this, Usually with strategy, we anticipate that there are goals, there are issues indicated, strategies that could lead to the result, but you don't go too much in regulatory issues. In this particular case, we understand that legislative initiatives could come only next year, and it takes a process. So in a way, strategy should anticipate what actually would be legis uh, regulatory issues, at least indicate that investments could can be started or at least as a process could go to, towards final investment uh, decisions. So it is quite, quite a high um, yeah, task, in my opinion, for this strategy. Additionally, to make a more word challenge, so the strategy is called Industrial Carbon Management Strategy. You please excuse me that I will use sometimes CCS strategy because it's slightly misleading, but it's more politically misleading, not so much by content wise, uh, but uh, that I think is still about CCS, it's not about it. It is a more precise name, politically correct name for the strategy that is being used. So uh, the, the seminars that we will look forward will be started by introduction uh, by papers that we recently published by Florence School of Regulation by my colleague Christopher Jones on what regulatory options could be. Then we move to the panel discussion uh, and we have fantastic uh, uh, group of panelists because each of them represents slightly different audience. And I will introduce immediately before giving the floor to Christopher's presentation. We have Chris Davies uh, from CCS Europe. Uh, Chris is a former MEP and long-term advocate of, uh, for CCS. He has been the rapporteur for the directive on the geolo geological storage of carbon dioxide. 
I was commissioner at that time, and I could say that not being very hostile to CS, I was slightly skeptical that this directive could be adopted, but Chris steered it very, very well. And it was adopted without so much opposition from public opinion as I have expected uh, during that time. Now, uh, see, uh, Chris is heading the CCS Europe, and this organization mission is to secure the rapid deployment of carbon capture technologies to curb CO2 emissions from industry and other hard to abate sources. We have uh, Caroline Brown from Landverma. She's team lead business development and carbon removal. Landverma's core business is a biomethane, but with CCS, it could provide some very appealing alternatives for really moving towards uh, the net zero um, uh, target by 2050. We have uh, Lee Hancho. Uh, she's uh, from the house. She's part-time professor at Florence School of Regulation, but she also is a professor at European Law at the University of Tilburg. She has very broad expertise in regulation, so in a way she could confirm or oppose some ideas that has been published by Christopher, because at the end of the day, even its publications, the views are Christopher's. So, so it does not mean that it's cons absolute consensus of FSR. We have also Christian Egenhofer. He is associate of senior research fellow at uh, CEPS and the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, Christian has, I think, the one of is the one of uh, persons that has the most broader experience of EU energy law. So he has followed for for very closely all the issues that have developed. Uh, CCS is not his major area of interest, but as a general framework, definitely his opinion is crucial, really how to advance with CCS in this situation. We have Axel Scheuer from International Organization of Oil and Gas Producers. Axel Scheuer is a senior policy main, uh, manager at IOGP. He managed a team which oversees a broad range of EU policy initiatives. Uh, the ones that follow the methane file in the EU uh, have seen very regularly him. Now it, uh, it's the same with CCS. So he has vast experience and uh, regulatory issues in the EU. And definitely industry plays a very key role in the whole process, as in any, but uh, here perhaps more than the other issues that we have uh, discussed here. And the concluding remarks will come from Edith Hofer from European Commission. She is deputy head of unit, DG Energy, decarbonization uh, and sustainability of energy sources. So Edith will make concluding remarks. So that is the outline of today's uh, discussion. Saying said this, I think all of you are impatient to see Christopher's presentation. The paper is published. You could find it um, by FSR publication, but it's always better to hear than only to read. So uh, please, uh, um, uh, Christopher's presentation. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to talk about the, the regulatory challenges in relation to regulating the future CO2 grid. We all know that the development of a CO2 grid is urgent. Uh, the effect of the ETS on the CBAM in exposing um, exactly those companies that we are going to need to use CCS uh, to the full effects of the ETS progressively until uh, the mid 2030s uh, means that without a CCS grid by that time, a CO2 grid, um, we will be creating ourselves a very difficult competitive situation for these companies. Um, that and um, the need to prepare a grid, CO2 grid, for, specifically for achieving negative emissions to meet the Green Deal targets, means that it's really essential. So I'd like to look at um, some of the questions on how such a regulatory framework to actually catalyze the development of this grid rather than uh, acting as a break on the development of grid could work. Um, so I'll just share some slides. What is the specificity of the CO2 grid? Why, why can't we simply take that, the electricity, gas, and the hydrogen package, notably the last hydrogen package, and say, well, hang on a minute, CO2 is a molecule. 
Let's simply transpose what we've done for electricity, gas, and hydrogen. Um, and the point is that the CO2 grid will be very different from these, these grids, because firstly, it's likely to be far more atomistic in how many actors there are. Um, and secondly, there'll be lots of alternatives in terms of methodologies to transport stuff. So we've already seen, for example, that some of the, or at least one of the, um, the big CO2 projects, Longship, um, is not using pipes, it's using boats. Um, we've already seen uh, CO2 being transported, not just in uh, pipelines, but also in, uh, can be done by train, can be done by truck. Um, there will be many, many different actors in terms of storage. And there's a lot of potentiality for at least local pipelines. So it's going to be far more atomistic and there's going to be greater possibilities. And so the question whether infrastructure will or will not be an essential service will depend not only on the nature of the assets. So, for example, in, in relation to gas, it's relatively easy, isn't it? I mean, the distribution system, we know it's an essential service, the transmission system, it's an essential service. Storage, by and large, by and large, it's an essential service. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of easy to assume asset classes. Um, in relation to CO2, it kind of looks like it will be difficult to identify asset classes, possibly with the ex exception of the, um, the, tr the trunk transport grid. So what we call the transmission grid in, in relation to gas or hydrogen, uh, which is reasonably likely to be an asset class that is um, an essential service for people. May or may not be in individual cases, but you could probably say that it is. But most other, with a poss again another possibility exception, would I would I would personally argue would be at least parts of the offshore grid, but not necessarily all of it. So it's going to be a very difficult case by case atomistic approach, much more than in relation to electricity and gas and hydrogen. Um, nonetheless some parts of the supply chain will certainly be an essential service uh the ones i mentioned in particular and without those it will be impossible um for emitters so think steel cement chemicals etc um to have access to them um another issue is with the possible exception of the main co2 pipeline investors won't have a asset base, so a large number of assets, over which they'll be able to, to spread risk. So in relation to electricity, gas and hydrogen, when you're building a distribution system, when you're building a um, transmission system, when you're building a storage system, typically you have a regulated asset base over, to, over which you can spread the risk of a, of a single identifiable investment. In the CO2 grid, you're going to have lots more single identifiable investments, which are not part of a larger asset base. Um, in many cases, some cases, this, this is illustrative of the fact there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, in some cases, will it be many cases, infrastructure will be built by an emitting company to serve its own needs. So in particular, um, capture and local um transport facilities to a grid um somebody will build the infrastructure for their own need and so if you have third party access to that it makes it really tricky to invest we'll talk about that in a minute last thing is unbundling is really different here um because we're not talking about a product you can actually use we're talking about a product you want to get rid of um and so somebody who is emitting it okay will not be actually selling it to somebody. They'll be paying somebody to get rid of it for them. And so there's no upstream product per se. So there's two reasons why you need a bundling, um, why you need um, regulated th third party access in particular, um, and unbundling. Um, and that is, okay, if it's an essential service, you can do two things. You can discriminate against somebody in terms of access to the network. Okay, you can prevent them having access in order to gain a competitive advantage. So if you're a gas producer and you own the transmission grid, 
you can prevent other people having access to your transmission grid to foreclose the downstream markets. Now, obviously, that is not relevant here. Okay. The other reason why you have third party, um, sorry, unbundling is in order to prevent abusive pricing. Because if you have an essential service um, and you're not regulated, you can charge whatever you like. So the issue of unbundling per se will not be a problem, but the issue of regulated third party access to prevent um, excessive pricing will be an issue. So, okay, vertical unbundling is, is very unlikely to be a problem here. Now, so it therefore seems to me that a specific approach is required. And I think three areas need to be considered in terms of determining how a specific approach could be achieved. So the first problem is, or the first issue to address, is a substantive one. So on the one hand, a lack of effective regulation can prevent an investment. For example, you're not going to invest in capture if you are not certain that you're going to have transport and storage in a cost-effective way. Okay, so a lack of effective regulation can prevent an investment. But on the other hand, if you have too much regulation, uh, you can actually prevent disincentive disincentivize investment. Uh, for example, in capture facilities, local pipe evacuation, um, and also the issue of too early regulation needs to be addressed, like it was in, in relation to the gas and hydrogen package, where even in relation to areas where regulated TPA is obligatory, there's a grace period until early 2030s, um, by which member states can retain NTPA. There's a second problem that needs to be um, addressed, and that's temporal. So even if the Commission would accelerate things as quickly as it can. So 2024, um, we will have the strategy. 2025 is really early to put down a draft directive and regulation in relation to infrastructure. Um, but the end of 2025, perhaps, but even that's ambitious if you've got to do all the consultations, impact assessments, and do them properly. Um, but let's say it was done on the 1st of um, January 2026. Takes at least two years to negotiate, 2027, 2028. 18 months in which to implement it by, by member states, you're already into 2030. So we, let's face it, we will not have a directive and regulation for 2030. Um, but let me give you an example. Under the gas and hydrogen package, um, ammonia import terminals, so hydrogen import terminals, ammonia import terminals, Rifombo import, um, are subject to Mm, we are trying to reshare it, although I'm not sure we can improve the visualization now, but we can for sure uh, publish the content of this video and the video itself on our webpage and give you an update in case uh, today's experience is not um, high quality for you. Let's try again. Um. 2026 takes at least two years to negotiate 2027 2028 18 months in which to implement it but by member states you're already into 2030 so we let's face it we will not have a directive and regulation for 2030 um but let me give you an example under the gas and hydrogen package um Ammonia import terminals, so hydrogen import terminals, ammonia import terminals, Rifombo import, um, are subject to negotiated third party access. Um, some companies are building crackers, dissociators, for their own use. So a terminal basically is a jetty, it is a uh, ammonia storage tank, it is a cracker. Hydrogen storage tank, then it's evacuated. Okay. Um, but hydrogen companies um, are building their own crackers in these terminals, but they're using it for their own business. Now, according to the directive, 
Um, those crackers will be part of the terminal and subject to third party access, ne negotiated third party access. But when they're building, if they want to build a cracker today, um, first of all, being as the directive won't be implemented by member states until 2026, okay, 18 months from March of this year, 2026. Um, so they won't actually know what type of negotiated NTP they will be getting until 20, late 2026, 2027. There is the possibility of an exemption like Article 36, but they won't be able to get that until, again, 2027. So the lack of a clear regulatory framework is a really tricky thing for, for these companies because they're basically wanting to build a cracker for their own use for importing hydrogen to be able to sell it. The hydrogen, they're, they're gas companies, they're hydrogen companies, they're, they're not infrastructure companies, but they don't know to what extent they will have to make their own cracker available for third party access. So insecurity, temporal insecurity, not just substantive insecurity, can be a huge effective um, block to new investment. Finan finally, financial, CCS is urgent but very risky. Um, and so there will need to be some de-risking of it to make it happen. Let me explain that in a minute. So let's look at it in terms of substantive. I think I've already mentioned a lot of these, but there are various valuable options and the, the options don't change. Um, the options that have been developed over time in relation to electricity, gas and hydrogen are clearly relevant here. The question is not whether they're relevant, the question is how you apply them. So regulated, regulated uh, third party acts are negotiated, the possible, so first of all, do you make it regulated, basta? Do you make it negotiated, basta? Do you provide the possibility of exemptions, like you have in Article 36, and I think it's 62 of the gas and hydrogen, anyway. Um, or do you have an ad hoc regulatory regime adopted on licensing of an infrastructure? Um, or do you have it never regulated, outside the regulator framework? And the question is how to develop a process to determine how this is done. Now, I mentioned earlier that um, we are very unsure of how the CO2 network is really going to develop. I don't think any of us would be able to take a, a map and say, okay, well, from, um, oh, let's make it easy. Um, within Rotterdam Harbour, it will be done by X. Um, from Rotterdam to the Dutch coast, it will be done by Y. From the Dutch coast to storage, it will be done by Z. And the storage should be done by Alpha. That's impossible, we don't know. So we don't know how it's gonna look. So how are we gonna find approach that is effective and proportionate and take into account these substantive temporal and financial challenges? So the temporal challenge, um, I think I've already indicated, so I'm going to pass on that. The only thing I would say is that in order to find a solution to the temporal problem, um, we do need an evidence-based analysis, not a simple assumption on categorization. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, and then finally, I'd like to talk about the financial risks. Um, CCS, I would argue, at the moment is a highly risky investment. Imagine that you are a company that wants to invest in the transmission grid from industrial clusters to where we expect storage to be. Let's, let's just take it easy. Let's, let's say from um, central Germany to the North Sea. How do you know how much CO2 you're gonna need to have capacity to transport in 2035, 2030? Because you've got to build your pipe for 2030. You've got to build your network for 2030. You're not gonna build your pipe for 2027, that's obvious. Um, and the amount of CO2 that you are going to need to store is dependent very strongly on regulation, not by markets. First, I mean, for example, it would depend very largely on the ETS price and whether the ETS continues its trajectory, meaning that there would be no allowances 
at all by 2039, and that pretty much all industry would be brought into its full application, so no free allowances, because of um, the, the expansion of the CBAM. You don't know how much state aid is going to be available to CO2. Um, you don't know to what extent um, balancing electricity will be done by renewable hydrogen or in the interim period, whether it will be done using existing CCGTs, OCGTs and CCS, which is obviously going to be cheaper than hydrogen, but will that, will that be allowed in regulatory terms? Um, so for all these reasons, um, and I'll add one more, you don't know how the EU is going to really drive negative carbon uh, emissions. So the storage of biogenic CO2 and its permanent, sorry, the capture of biogenic CO2 and its permanent storage, we don't know how that is going to be priced and rewarded or incentivized. So for all of these things, none of us know how much exactly CO2 is going to be needed to be stored by 2030, 2035, 2040. Um, but because of the importance of this, assumptions have to be made, but it means that there's very high levels of risk. So there are some financing, financing op options. You can literally say, okay, we'll leave it to the market, leave it to merchants. But will that deliver what we need? I personally have doubts. Secondly, is it possible to develop some form of capital grant stroke contracts for difference so that member states will say, OK, I will give you 100 million. It's based on the assumption that you will transport 100 tonnes of uh, CO2 a year by 2030. If you transport, transport more, you pay me money back. If you transport less, you keep the money, for example. Um, is it possible to use cross mutualization like we have in relation to hydrogen? So in the, the final gas and hydrogen package, there is the possibility to um, use money from the natural gas market, from the transmission system to subsidize the hydrogen one. Uh, in relation to CO2, it seems more tricky. I'm not sure where you'd cross mutualize from. State guarantees. Um, this is clearly an option so that member states would give a state guarantee in relation to an assumption on how much CO2 would be uh, transported. A bit like the capital grant, but done through a state guarantee. Um, so it'd be almost like a CFD straight state guarantee. And the final financing obligation is just oblige industry to do it, like they're proposing in the Net Zero Industry Act. Um, I mean, the, the logical solution here is that each member state decides how they should do it. Um, but it would, I would argue that state guarantees or grants based on an, an assumption of how much CO2 will be transported by a TSO, um, which would be approved by our, an NRA and then based with a, a sort of like an infrastructure CFD model. So that, um, as I said, um, a company would say to the NRA, OK, I assume that in 2030, I need to build infrastructure to carry X. Uh, a member state will provide a guarantee that, OK, if, it, if X doesn't arrive, we will finance the difference. If more than X arrives, you pay us some of the profits. So if you like an infrastructure safety model, seems to me the most likely and effective way to do it. But um, this is obviously something that should be left to member states. So. A possible approach for discussion. How might this look in practice? And this is, as I say, it's for discussion in order to square this circle. So I would suggest perhaps in 2025, the Commission tables a regulation which would allow national regulatory authorities to take a decision specifying the relevant regulatory regime relating to certain classes of new infrastructure. So in other words, we would be allowing NRAs to create leg legitimate expectations. How would that work? So I wish to build a storage today. Um, I would go to my NRA and I would say to my NRA, um, okay, I want a license for this storage. And they would go through a process by which we determine whether or not it's a essential facility. 
and the NRA would determine, okay, will that be negotiated third party access, regulated third party access, or no regulation at all for certain dates. So very similar to an Article 36 gas type procedure. Um, one can have commission guidelines saying, um, okay, we have presumptions that certain assets should in principle fall within this category of regulation. Regulated third party access, negotiated third party access, no, no requirement for um, third party access at all. Um, in this way, you can get over the problem that we're not going to have a, um, a directive and regulation being into effect, certainly a directive um, into effect by 2030, um, and enable a learning process to be taken. Being as that the Commission would be involved in this Article 36 type procedure, um, there would be some certainty of a harmonious approach to regulating the assets over the next five, six years. And we can even have Commission guidelines based on extensive work and ensure that, um, that it's evidence-based. So in other words, what, what I'm kind of proposing is that you would have a ad hoc regulatory regime uh, which works on a case-by-case -case basis reflecting the very um, uncertain and potentially atomistic nature of this market and the fact that you can't really identify classes as easily as related to gas, electricity and hydrogen. So, okay, that class of assets um, are regulated TPA. So, this experience that you'd get in the next two, three, um, four years will give us real evidence and experience in order to produce a directive and regulation in early 2026 that would be um, appropriate and fact-based and evidence-based. Um, this, this is just very illustrative of what such guidance should might look at. So you could say, that um, CO2 capture and temporary storage, um, in principle, it's always competitive and TPN and bundling is never required. Um, but the NRA would need to look at it on a case by case basis to see whether NTPA would be needed. Um, local networks and direct lines, there could be a presumption that NTPA uh, was needed, but the NRA could look at it and say, well, actually in this case, there's plenty of competition instead of using the local networks or the direct lines, you can use um, trains, you can use trucks, somebody else can build their own one. Or you can actually say, well, you know, in this case, actually, it really is an essential service for reason ABC. The TSO natural network um, would be a principle that would always be re um, regulated TPA. But um, given the specific nature of the circumstances, the NRA could um, decide, well, no, actually, this is NTPA. And on the basis of this approach, one would have enough experience in order to determine um, what would be the correct approach in relation to the legislative the story, proposal in the presentation. by 2026. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you, everybody. Um, and um, I look forward to um, seeing the discussion, um, which I'll have to look at later. But many thanks indeed. Well, uh, I need to really to apologize for the quality. There, there was a lot of um, yeah, discussion. Christopher's uh, non-presence was really emergency, last minute emergency. So we went for the next best and uh, well, I should have checked better. Saying said this, I think Christopher definitely identified at least part of the issues. And uh, I think what we need definitely concentrate at this stage on substantial issues, because that's what matters. Temporal could be dealt with, at least in my experience, as you know, what are substantive approach you are following, that the time issue you could find how to minimize the negative impact in time. But it's important really to have good perception where you go. And I will start with a panelist, with uh, Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, you have long experience with CCS. And, and now this uh, EU industrial carbon management strategy will come out, uh, well, pretty soon. So what are the issues that you would like to see 
be addressed in it. Also in the light what Christopher said today, but it could be broader because you know that we focused only on some parts of the issues, I believe most important, but there are some issues that still also need to be mentioned in strategy. Chris. The biggest single thing is for the, is the political one, really, that the Commission needs to be stressing the, the urgency of, uh, of delivering CCS. Uh, you mentioned before that I took the CO2 storage directive through the European Parliament, but that was back in 2008. Here we are 16 years later, there was no CO2 being stored yet on a commercial basis. And yet the figures coming out from the Commission are, you know, by 2050, we should be storing 300 million tonnes of, of CO2 annually. 50 million tonnes or thereabouts, at least the capacity to do so by, by 2030. The, the urgency is, is, the need for member states to crank up is, is absolutely essential. And yet in the draft uh, strategy that we've uh, just, that's just started doing the circulation, there's a classic sentence, which is CCS still needs to be recognised by governments across Europe as a legitimate and necessary option to decarbonise. So after all these years, basically the Commission in draft is saying that most governments still haven't got the message. And that's possibly due to a you know, lack of leadership on the part of the Commission. It's also, of course, because for many years there hasn't really been a business case. But now, you know, here's uh, Christopher saying we won't have a regulation on some of these things before 2030. Well, carbon allowances, the end of free allowances are coming. Uh, the ETS price is going to be soaring. Uh, there are companies, there's pipeline operators like SNAM and OGE and things that want to want to get started, but, but uh, need regulatory certainty when it comes, for example, to standards for carbon purity, for what's going to go in the pipelines, really, the temperature, the, 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 uh, uh, the all sorts of things. But there's lots of, um, it seems to me that the crucial thing here is for member states to become the drivers. And if there's anything encouraging at all that's taking place at the moment, it's the way in which a country like Denmark, which until you know, five, which five years ago I would have still regarded as, as deeply CCS skeptical, has really put in place now clear targets, a strategy, financial support mechanisms, has had taken the first final investment decision to support a full chain CCS project. You know, in a relatively short period of time, it's, it, it's gathered cross-party support and got this CCS recognized as a key part of its strategy. So, you know, the, the message for me is simply we need to be pressing all the buttons and driving this forward because we haven't got time to waste. Clear uh, uh, message is very clear. So uh, now, if I could go most to Carolina, Caroline, um, there is um, uh, one I would say a very strong. Uh, or big or nice carrot in the whole package is negative emissions. And uh, definitely, if you connect um, biogas or biomeat and VCCS, we have a chance to create negative emissions. So what what are your expectations? How quickly do we need to ramp up this, uh, these options? And what is needed from the regulatory EU and state support in this respect? Because it's definitely something that allows our more flexibility to finding temporary solutions, or even later on could be very good commercial options. So, Caroline. Thank you very much. Um, so basically, we're going to get in line of the companies that want to get started on uh, CCS and creating negative emissions through CCS. I, I think we sometimes fall into the trap when it comes to negative emissions to think about this as something we are doing after 2050, when uh, we reach net zero, then we're starting to create negative emissions. But in order to get there, we, um, in my opinion, need to start uh, creating negative emissions right now. And that's where um, Landwärme and uh, biomethane with CCS comes in, because we are able to start right now on several pillars of the um, path to net zero. So for one, with biomethane, we can start defossilizing industry that currently use natural gas in existing infrastructure um, with existing technology that is ready to scale. And on our end of the CO2 value chain, the same is basically true for carbon capture. So the technology we are using to um, get CO2 from off-gas streams of biogas upgrading, so CO2 that has been drawn from the atmosphere by plants, is readily available. We 
would be able to implement this as at any future virus upgrading facility on our way to 35 BCM biomethane um, and create lots of negative emissions like that. The problem is um, the supply chain after that and also the incentivation for it. So things we need for one, um, Chris mentioned it as well, storage capacity. There is virtually no existing accessible storage capacity uh, in Europe, with the exception of solutions like mineral storage. So we have a CCS project right now. We are storing CO2 from a biogas upgrading plant in uh, concrete uh, recycling. And we would like to see um, some broadening of the scope uh, for um, storage to include these options as well, because right now, a lot of the time, the um, CCS directive is referenced when it comes to storage, and that leads to us only considering geological storage, which will be an extremely important part of the storage. But if we want to start ramping up right now, we should um, look into where else we can store CO2. Then, of course, accessible infrastructure. So we're looking um, at multimodal hubs. I, I think that we'll have to develop because we are going to have a lot of sources and a lot of potential uses and storages, and uh, those have to be regulated somehow. Um, we are, when we're talking about this market in the future, also looking at the need for robust carbon accounting. So we have to figure out where the CO2 is actually coming from and where it's going to, how long it will be um, durably stored if we want to uh, incentivize based on that. Um, here, a lot of work is happening on the voluntary carbon market, but we um, need some regulation on it as well. And then lastly, financing, so incentivization. We need a business case for carbon removals. We see that market-based mechanisms work. Um, for example, when we're looking at the GHG quota, where we can build a business case like around carbon removal at biogas upgrading um, plants already, if the rest of the chain is in place. Um, but for example, an inclusion in the EU ETS would be um, helpful. Yeah. Uh, if I could allow a follow-up question, because Morella asked, I think, very, very pertinent question. She asked, is it not confusing to mix CCS and bioenergy with CCS, it should be addressed separately or it is still part of CCS? Um, so I, I think um, all of the issues I just mentioned, um, they are addressing a lot of parts of the value chain. And I think many of them apply to both um, carbon management from industrial sources that do not create negative emissions and the source like biomethane. So both need the infrastructure. Some um, emitters are going to emit both fossil and biogenic CO2, and both will have to be managed and accounted for. Um, there are, of course, areas where it is very important to be very clear about if we are reach, uh, talking about CCS or carbon dioxide removal. So, yeah, um, precise wording is an issue sometimes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Lee, um, could I come now to, to uh, solutions that Christopher proposed on substantial approaches and also temporal? What is your views? What are your views? Uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, I read uh, the paper with great interest and, and commented on it at the time. Um, so with regard to uh, infrastructure access, of course, the, the rules that we have on gas and electricity are predicated on the idea that people don't actually want someone to use their infrastructure. So we're kind of forcing them to do so. Um, forcing them either to give third party access or to negotiate it. But I wonder, with carbon capture, um, if we should start from that premise, because um, it looks indeed uh, that it's very problematic um, to get storage off the ground for lots of reasons. So perhaps um, the developers would be anxious to have everybody on board rather than keep them out. So I think we have to ask what the purpose of regulation is uh, here, um, because uh, it's, we don't really have any regulation, as far as I know, that force people to build things. Um, that's one maybe of the big problems we have uh, when we look at interconnectors. Um, so that's one thing. 
Um, I can see the argument um, if we uh, assume that there will be risks that people might want to um, build something and keep others out or charge monopoly rents, that you might need some form of, of regulatory oversight. And um, one of the proposals from Christopher is, well, um, let's kind of have a, a wait and see um, approach. Um, so let's... Um, set out a framework, a regulatory framework that will eventually apply. Um, so with a sort of a time lapse, temporal um, exemption. And then uh, reg the, the people entering the sector will know um, what to expect. So um, the question would be to what extent this sort of regulatory holiday approach um, is a good thing. We 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 see a sort of similar approach in um, in the early drafts uh, of the hydrogen uh, package. Um, now the problem with with um, exceptions is they're always case by case. Uh, they're ad hoc. I think Christopher mentioned that too. And if we look at the history of exemptions from from gas and electricity, um, that takes a long time to negotiate them. Uh, you have to go through a lot of hoops. And there is no guarantee that every regulator will apply the same criteria. Um, so it's 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 not, I think, um, the best of solutions um, because, as I say, it's all ad hoc. It depends um, a great deal on individual regulators. Um, you see also regulators adding new criteria, challenged eventually, struck down by the, by the European courts, as in the Ackland case is a good example. Um, so you don't get much regular, regulatory certainty uh, through an exemption procedure. Um, so that's something to take on board. Um, finally, um, I was asked actually to comment on whether a holiday, a regulatory holiday, would create legitimate expectations by those who um, apply, if you like, uh, and that, of course, is very problematic in European law. Um, our, our courts are very reluctant to um, endorse um, a policy that would allow um, would allow people to claim, well, we had a legitimate expectation that the law would never change. That, that um, I don't think would apply. So I don't think it would be, I don't think regulatory holidays are, are really going to be the answer here. I think we need to look deeper into why um, this has not become an option for the market. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Very, a lot of wisdom. So on a regulatory holiday, it's very clear answer, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Christian, perhaps uh, you could give some advice how to proceed now, because uh, is there has been some similar case uh, in Europe opinion uh, during the whole EU energy policy developments. So is there some similarities or where shortcuts could be made and also um, main issues that you would see with advancing quickly the file through the strategy and the next uh, steps? Christian. Uh, Christian, you are muted. We don't hear you. would need to start again. We don't hear you. Yes. No? No? With my earphones. Yeah, now it's good. Now it's why I heard something. Is it now working? Perfect. Wait, there was something. Okay, technology. No. Uh, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, I'm not a PCS specialist, and I would just you know, repeat this, and it's very hard to follow Lee. Now, when I hear this discussion, and also your question, I hear two big par points, and that's the urgency. Gris and many others have mentioned it. And the other one is the risk, the regulatory risk, commercial risk, uh, uh, technology risk. Now, this probably needs something um, you know, which is simple, you know, and what I'm be hearing here wasn't not uh, very simple. And Lee mentioned it again. We have some ex ex post or case by case analysis that I don't think works with the 
the the simplicity and the urgency now what we also need in in this case and there we can go to the 1990s deregulation uh when you got new entrants you know they entered into the market because they got good margins huh? so it needs to be profitable um uh, in 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 addition, that's what uh, we really uh, understood at the time. Talk about telecoms. There was huge margins to be made initially, and then after a couple of years, of course, the regulator brought uh, this stone. Now, the key element, I guess, here is really uh, the the risk uh, guarantees. And one point I was thinking when I was reading the paper, which was which was excellent, is really. Why don't we look more to availability uh, payments? Now, when you look at all the infrastructure, we're going to have more infrastructure, electricity, gas, hydrogen, CO2, and they all uh, correspond with each other. And the throughput may be changing according to regulation, according to technology, et cetera, et cetera. So we will see infrastructure which may be underutilized and over, over the time, and that may change over time. So couldn't we think about uh, something like uh, availability payment initially so that the infrastructure is built. And then, of course, we need to think about how we we, 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 we regulate the assets, uh, the, the access to this. Now, the big advantage really about, and I'll stop with uh, this then, is uh, of availability payments. You know, we had it in capacity remuneration mechanism, which initially was despised by DG competition, and now it becomes a big, uh, an essential element uh, of the new market design. Now, the advantage is really it can remunerate, it creates incentive, incentives uh, to fetch uh, this remuneration in the market to get additional um, um, income. Uh, it deals with initial low demand, and ensures also about the risks of changing, fluctuating, or decreasing even uh, throughput. This I would like just to put, maybe there are people having uh, views on this. Thank you, Christian. Um, now we move to Axel. Uh, the good news is that IOGP has published quite recently paper creating a sustainable business case for CCS value chain. At least in this particular case, I would say industry has very clear views. It, I'm not saying that everything uh, should be accepted by other stakeholders, but at least for industry, it is very, very clear vision what needs to be done, how the strategy should be going ahead. Uh, Axel, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andres, and thanks to the school, Florence School of Regulation to providing this platform for dialogue. Um, I have the pleasure to have the energy and climate policy team at, at IOGP Europe, and I can tell you that our members, the large oil and gas companies, are very active in, in the space of CCS. They want this to uh, uh, happen now. We have gathered with our members and developed a CO2 storage capacity ambition by 2050. Um, and here on the graph, you see a little um, fundamental data we are discussing. The storage, our storage ambition is to um, develop 0.5 to 1 billion tons of CO2 storage injection capacity by 2050, provided the enabling and supportive framework is being established. So that's that's a big if. Let me lead you briefly through the numbers. Um, today, Europe has about 3 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. The known storage projects in the EU aggregate um, to about 35 million tons of storage. If all known projects today are materializing, it would be 35 million tons by 2030. So it's below what the Net Zero Industry Act aims at, the 50 million ton objective. There may be projects out there which will still be published and materialize, um, but they take five to 10 years uh, to materialize. It just takes time to develop storages, drill the wells and all that. If you use all known projects, all phases in the Europe, you're getting to above 100 million tons. So if you include Norway and, and the UK, um, you can store quite a bit of um, CO2 by 2030. 
If we look at the recent EU scenarios uh, from the Fit for 55 um, um, scenario calculations, there's the life scenario, there's the tech scenario, different scenarios are all leading towards 1.5 degree or aiming at that. They were forecasting a need for CO2 storage of 300 to 600 million tons. Those are forecasts from two, three years ago. I'm here they are changing and there have been new numbers being presented at the CCS forum. The new numbers in the proposed industrial carbon management strategy, which has been leaked, uh, which are much lower, much lower. So that surprises us because a study which uh, very comprehensively has been done by multiple industry parties, Deloitte leading it, suggested there will be 1.2 to 1.5 billion tons of CO2 storage need by 2050. That assumes that industry is not leaving Europe, and that assumes a role for, for blue hydrogen in the buildup towards a hydrogen economy, because the renewables are just not delivering on time to produce all this hydrogen needed. So, so there's the ambition. There's no doubt the geological storage space exists in Europe, uh, and there are the oil and gas producers who have the organizational capacity to develop such storages. But what is, why didn't it happen so far? And let's just go back to the 70s and 80s, when at least I was, I was a kid and my parents uh, installed a natural gas heating system and all their neighbors as well. It was the big new thing, 70s, oil crisis, natural gas, everybody wanted it, politicians wanted it. Why did that happen? Why was it so successful? Within 10, 20 years, all of a sudden you had 20% in the energy mix of, with, with natural gas. And it happened because natural gas producers found gas instead of oil in the midst of the North Sea in Germany, in the Netherlands and elsewhere. And uh, there were consumers who wanted to switch away from oil or was getting quite expensive. In the middle, you had uh, the pipeline companies who always are happy to build pipelines if somebody books them and pays for them. So, so what did they do? Concluded long-term contracts, balancing risks and rewards. Producers with big suppliers who bought big long-term, sold short-term small volumes to consumers. Consumers had certainty for 25 years, just like emitters are looking for it, to, um, uh, to have a, a heating system now based on gas. What was the basis for that? There was one, a business case. Everyone along the value chain could make its earnings. Pipeline companies were happy uh, making some return, producers, suppliers, and consumers bought an energy which was lower cost than oil. It was economic for everyone. There was a business case. Secondly, long-term contracts were concluded along the value chain, balancing risks and rewards, providing certainty. Long-term contracts much needed to do that. And by the way, thirdly, the regulatory framework was probably uh, a two pages in the energy law. Now, where are we today? And uh, Andres, thanks for mentioning the paper we put together with our members and uh, using also uh, data from a RISTAT modulation tool, and I'm showing that to you here. We did three scenarios um, for integrated CCS value chain levelized cost based on that RISTAT tool. So some modulation cost you can always discuss and challenge, but really the lowest cost scenario was 130 euros are needed as a tariff for the entire value chain to have an economic investment up to 230. So long value chains, short value chains, big volumes, big storages, and so forth, you know, minimum, maximum assumptions, 130 to 230 euros a ton CO2 are needed to make it economic for the entire value chain. That compares with the 80 to 100 euros uh, incentive from the ETS allowances, i.e. it's not economic yet, which is why it is not there. So. So what is needed, and we talk about that in our paper quite a bit, um, um, what is needed to make the value chain economic for everyone to, to earn something, to have an incentive to do what we all want them to do. Let's start with the emitters. They need to be enabled not only to invest into the capture equipment, but also to conclude long-term contracts. They want that. They want certainty that they you know, someone will pick up their CO2 emissions from the cement factory, not only next year, but for the next 10 years or 20 years. Um, but these long-term contracts need to underpin the transportation investment and the investment into storage. Yes. They are the ones who have the incentive from the ETS scheme, but we know it's too little money at this stage. So they need CCFDs 
beyond the targeted funding they receive, possibly, and they need to be enabled to enter into long-term off-take contracts. The transportation companies in the middle, well, they are happy to build pipelines across the countries if someone books books it. Now, the someone who books it is not there yet because it's an ascent market, so they need some government-backed guarantees. They also need to have the long-term capacity bookings. Possibly there's a role for regulated tariffs, but that depends, and I will get into that in a minute. CO2 aggregators in the middle have a role, just like natural gas suppliers have in the gas business, who buy big times, long term, uh, sell short term, small volumes, de-risking this middle bit. So CO2 aggregators can have a role in the middle, don't need to, but they can have a role. Storage operators, well, we are not shying away from targeted funding for storages, but what we really need is long term store or pay contracts. At FID, when we decide to invest into storages, there needs to be a minimum certainty that someone is there who wants that storage and will store and pay us for our investment. So there's a long-term store or pay contracts are a key element in this balance. So let me move on uh, to the next and final slide um, with regard to the you know, sort of more narrowed down uh, topic of this um, uh, webinar, the regulation of CO2 infrastructure. Uh, we are in the process of developing a more detailed position, but early uh, considerations we want to share is, well, first of all, and I think I agree much with what uh, Chris uh, Jones has uh, said here. First of all, let's allow storage service providers to compete against each other. There are storage sites all over the place in Europe. Let's find the most cost-efficient solutions, and that is enabled by competition between storage providers. Our members are used to compete against each other. They can do that in the storage space as well. So let's limit the regulation to pipeline transportation. Let's not get into ships, barges, trains. I think there's a broad agreement on that. But even for pipeline transportation, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Let's peel the onion. There's gathering pipelines, possibly owned by the emitter. There are point-to-point -point pipes somewhere in the middle. There are local cluster networks and harbors. There are multimodal larger grids. And there are the last mile pipelines leading to the storage uh, directly, possibly owned offshore by uh, the storage operator. So it's really different. Let's be sophisticated in, in, in any approach. Let's avoid uncertainty. It was mentioned uh, before. Uh, let's avoid developing the perfect regulation that can delay and deter investments. Let's consider a light touch approach. The transparency and non-discriminatory access requirements, which we have for the upstream pipeline networks and the oil and gas uh, business, you know, require you to be transparent, to be non-discriminatory in your approach. That's a very light touch, but effective approach to regulation. The CCS market is nascent, um, but the value chains to be established are complex, more complex than in the renewables world where you build a windmill connected to an existing grid, you supply existing consumers. It's more sophisticated, so it requires more sophisticated regulated delineation. You know, who's paying the pressure, the cost, you have the, the cost in the system are for cooling and pressuring. The one who's doing it has the cost. Is it the pipeline company? Is it the emitter? Is it the storage operator? So there's quite a bit of, of, of sophistication here. Negotiated solutions between parties along the value chain may balance risks, rewards more effectively than regulation can. So let's also avoid unnecessary cost of strict standards. Let's not forget CO2 purity is a nice thing to have. You know, we have all the same quality. But it costs a lot of money to get to a certain purity level. So let's be careful. If both are happy with less pure um, um, CO2, uh, the storage operator as well as the emitter and the transportation company, let's not artificially require them to have a certain purity standard. And find my final point, let's provide investor certainty. Let's ensure that there's grandfathering when investment decisions have been taken. Let's not come back uh, on those who invest their monies and make this all happen and change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. Exemptions on opt-in rights may be technical solutions to be included in a detailed regulation. So thank you for this opportunity.
Thank you, Axel. Thank you. I think it was very clear. Uh, and now for all the participants, we you have had enough information. Now we would like to hear your opinion. We have Paul with some questions. For panelists, could you be kindly looking on the questions? Uh, there are some specific questions uh, that you could perhaps address already in the box, or you will have a chance to once again come back. Perhaps you would like to pick up other questions that you would like to have. So let's move to the poll. What is the most important deliverable for for the CCUS strategy, to be correct, the industrial carbon management strategy should be uh, setting EU targets, uh, announcing major EU subsidies in a form like hydrogen banks that was done for hydrogen, uh, or setting out a roadmap for a predictable regulatory framework in the short term. And uh, the fourth option is catalyzing member state subsidies via uh, national uh, energy and climate plans. So please make your choice. And the results. So what we have as the results. So it's a clear majority look for setting out roadmap for predictable regulatory framework in the short term. So that means that substantive um, issues that Christopher mentioned and also temporal man, uh, matters. So that means quite a very strong, I would say high demand from the strategies being exactly expected. Uh, so next question, please. So the next question is coming. Yes. How important is to develop an innovative regulatory approach because no CCUS directive and regulation will be enforced before around 2030? It could be faster, but it is based on existing experience. First, very important, uncertainty will kill investment. Second option, not so important. The likely framework is largely predictable, and this can be internalized in investment decisions. And the third option, not important. Your choice, please. Yeah, that's a very important uncertainty will kill investment. So, so nobody has taken not important. So it should be addressed. Uh, as soon uh, as possible and as detailed as possible. Thank you. And then uh, next. What would be the most needed form of state aid to kickstart the industry at scale? Uh, state guarantees for transmission and storage, state grants for infrastructure, or uh, the third option is grants for emitters to cover the cost gap from the ETS. There was indications that ETS, at least at this stage, does not provide enough financial incentive. Oh, <laughs> all options are important. <laughs> so so it's, it's really unexpected a bit, but uh, yeah. There is no clear favorite. Uh, yeah, thank you. And if I now can move back to panelists to make any comment on the questions that you got uh, or um, or any issues that came out from the polls, I would appreciate very much. Uh, this time, time is, um, is really, uh, I would ask to do it in two minutes so uh, that we would have also for Edis to make a concluding remarks. So I will start uh, with Chris. Well, first of all, I just want to say I listened to Axel's uh, presentation just now, and I, I'm, uh, you know, CCS Europe in particular tries to represent the hard to abate sectors like steel and cement and, and what have you, rather than the oil and gas sector. But I think I agreed with just about every word he said. And it's interesting when it comes to the setting of targets by the European Union that my understanding is that uh, he's saying that uh, what's coming out of the Commission at the moment is not ambitious enough. It's not suggesting that the, the requirements are going to be even greater than the commission is, is, is suggesting. My, my, I'll come back to the point I made before, of course, that the need for urgency, the need to get on with and make things happen. And this comes down to leadership. Um, I'm, you know, I'm very pleased with the way the commission has in the last couple of years picked up CCS. 
but it has been an abeyance for an awful long time. Um, and here we are, I think, Andres, you, you suggested this at the very beginning. You know, here we are at the very tail end of a commission and we're having a communication coming forward. And you know very well from your own experience as a commissioner, sometimes communications take on tangible form and sometimes they sit on shelves in themselves. They don't say a great deal. Um, what's what's uh, absolutely crucial to, 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 for me, I think, is to look at the development of CCS through the minds of a potential uh, developer. Uh, we have at the moment the very first project in Europe, the Kalimbor Hub, Hub project, first one to get a financial investment decision, Denmark capturing 430,000 tonnes of biogenic CO2. To meet even the Commission's target that it's currently talking about, 200 million tonnes of storage by, by, um, uh, by uh, 2040, we need a project of that size every 10 days between now and 2040. Every 10 days. I mean, we're just not even scratching the surface at the moment. And that's where it comes down to, to, to member states. We can't afford to wait to 2030 for regulation. We need the basic requirements, you know, the basic, basic standardization, as, as, as uh, Axel mentioned on CO2 purity and the like. We need things like that to come out quickly. We need proposals for de-risking as much as possible. That might be using the insurance companies, or it might be simply the fact that member states take a lead in setting up crangos to, to, to drive forward some of, the, uh, some of the initiatives needed. But fundamentally, it's leadership. And if you are carbon, if you're thinking as, a cement, as the operator of a cement plant in Eastern Europe, and you're thinking, I know that I'm going to have to pay a fortune to, for allowances in 10 years time, and I'm still going to be emitting CO2. So I need to go down the CCS line. And you approach your government. Just at the moment, most of those governments have got closed doors. They don't know what they wouldn't know what to do with you if you came along and said, you know, we need to we need to uh, uh, build a CO2 storage infrastructure and we need to be, be able to get our C CCS, our, our CO2 to it. They're just not geared up to it. The vast majority of member states have still not engaged. And so I come back to the national energy and climate plans, perhaps. And the fact that the majority of member states have just paid lip service in those NECPs. And over the next few months, when the final versions are prepared, the Commission needs to be pushing those member states like mad to say, you've got to address the issue of industrial decarbonisation seriously. And CCS is a key, has a key role to play in that strategy. Make it happen. Thank you. Carolina. Carolina. Um, I would, if possible, like to address uh, two of the questions in the Q&A box, just because I'm uh, trying to type answers and that uh, might be interesting to all of them. There's one question from Ruta Lerud uh, regarding um, how do you value bio CO2 if the captured carbon from biomethane plants are already valued through lower carbon intensities of the biomethane products? Um, so I think one thing uh, that has to be very clear and comes back to robust accounting is that we have to be um, sure there is no double accounting of any biogenic qualities of the CO2 or um, carbon removals in that space. At the moment, as I mentioned, we have the option to create a business case for, uh, for carbon removals if biomethane goes into transportation in Germany, mostly. Um, but that's a very narrow scope in which this works. So we still need a more broad approach um, to make, uh, make the scaling viable. And then we need accounting to make sure um, this question is solved correctly. And then maybe another approach, uh, another question also in the Q&A box is um, regarding fermentation industries in the US um, um, being a big proponent for carbon removals because of the clean CO2 streams. That is basically the point uh, we are making as well, which would be that for carbon removals to start um, incentivizing capture wherever it is um, the most cost and energy efficient, um, which um, goes hand in hand with, I think, market-based incentives for negative emissions. Thank you. Lee. Thank you. Oops, I put myself back on. Um, mute. Sorry, I have to unmute myself. Um... No, it's fine. You are oh, yeah, unmuted. Fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that was a fascinating discussion. I think I have a question, um, really, um, 
that hasn't come up yet, but I, I have sat on the other sort of side of the, and been a, a sort of regulator in the Netherlands looking at oil and gas licenses, and we had to do licensing also for carbon capture. And what struck me, and that's not come up, is there's a lot, there's just a huge amount of public distrust um, for storage projects, which affects really the rollout um, considerably. Um, and that doesn't seem to have been addressed um, at commission level so far. I suppose that's a matter for member states. But um, I think until we address that problem, um, then that's going to be one of the key hold up issues. So one can have a perfect scheme of regulation for infrastructure, but um, it's going to be very difficult to roll anything out unless one has the public um, backing it. So. I wonder if anyone else has thoughts on that. Thank you. Can I just briefly come in, Lee? Yeah. Which is, you know, I keep thinking, I, Russia invaded Ukraine. We all build up our gas reserves. Apparently our gas reserves in, in, across Europe are at 99% at the moment. Where does the public think the gas is stored? I mean, you know, basically the CO2 storage and methane storage, the overlap is, 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 all, too, is all too clear, except, of course, we... We put the methane down and bring it back up again, whereas the CO2 is put down permanently. I mean, the, 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 the public arguments, the public arguments should be, is there to be won, I think. We put, put over, if, if again, there was some, some leadership about, and demonstration of the, not only the safety, but the, but the need for this, if we're to avoid the emissions going into the atmosphere. But that's, my question is, why is it not happening then? Well, I mean, obvious, but, but then, but then, as we know, the, as Andrew said right at the very beginning, OK, 16 years ago, the CO2 storage directive was put into place um, and immediately seven member states decided they didn't want to use it and didn't want to have any CO2 storage. Uh, and still the uh, if you if you can't get the political leaders to uh, to, to recognize what Axel was saying, for example, about the, the, the fact that this is going to be needed on a very large scale, even larger than the commission is, suge is suggesting, then we're nowhere. It comes down to the politicians. Well, on public opinion, I think CEPs is doing a study. There will be some presentation, I think, in a week. Uh, they will go, come out. But I believe what has changed, and I believe in Europe, is that industrial future is a crucial issue. So it changes also this public attitude towards storage. If you don't have solution, you have a problem. You have a problem of, uh, like Macron said, the number of people that are thinking not about the end of the world, but uh, end of the month will increase. And that, I think, is coming in. So there is another political equation, and I believe that there will be more developments of it, because not it either if there is basically you need it. It is, I think, it's also clear understanding from EU policies, but it's true, it needs to be communicated better. Christian, now it's to you. Uh, could you be very short? I know that you are, and the same also to Axel. I would like to, definitely that Edith comes in. Yeah, no worries. Let me just uh, ask a, a question here. You know, I'm. we had a debate about whether CO2 is so radically different from the other uh, infrastructure assets, and now I'm a bit more confused. I think we, we would need a bit more discussion whether we're using existing templates or we really need to go uh, somewhere else. So that was brief enough, I spear, I hope. Very much, and I believe Axel has a, will have a comment on it because they have looked on, on all of the gases. Axel. Yes, absolutely. So let me let me make two comments. Let me start probably with a reaction to the poll, um, uh, uh, where there's a, the clear mandate for you know, or view on a clear roadmap and and, and regulatory certainty um, that should not be confused with a need for a comprehensive regulatory framework. Huh? Certainty and clear roadmap doesn't mean uh, comprehensive framework regulation. Uh, let me remind me remind you all on on when the natural gas industry probably used two pages in the German energy law to be established. So it can be light touch also. I'm not saying this; it must be light touch, uh, but there's you know that's the debate to be held in the future. Where we just raise our hand and say let's let's not embark on a on a mission which uh, deters investment. That's one comment. The other comment is. Um, uh, we picked, and that speaks to much of what was said, we picked the low-hanging fruits and the decarbonization uh, of, 
of our industry and of our society. CCS is one of the next lowest hanging fruits, next lowest cost decarbonization options on the path towards net zero. So we need to create a business case, I said it before, to kickstart the industry now. And for that, we do need uh, the, the some sort of support, especially for emitters, just like renewables have the support initially. They have the feed-in tariffs, giving the certainty on the price, on the value. They only took the operational, the production risk, so clear risk sharing here. Um, so we need to do that, especially for emitters now, to enable them to conclude the contracts. Um, I'm repeating myself a little. For example, through the tendering of uh, uh, carbon contracts for difference. At national levels, you tender, you find the lowest cost um, emitters who can capture. The industrial carbon management strategy in Germany will be uh, is being discussed, will be uh, released, uh, and may, may be a cornerstone for further development well, as well in that country. I think I stop here. Have I answered your question, Andres? I'm not sure. Yeah, you did. You did. Uh, so, um, it is uh, now for concluding remarks. The floor is yours. Uh, I know that you have a, quite a task and your colleagues, but uh, please, uh, your reflection after the debate of, of today. Thank you very much, Andres, and thank you very much to all the panelists on of of uh, this um, conference or this event today. I think it's very interesting, and um, I'm coming from the regular. I have a regulatory background from electricity and gas regulation, so it reminds me a lot of what we have discussed. I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, on uh, electricity and gas regulation. So, I sometimes have déjà vu's uh, when I hear this. Uh, but more on the, on the on the substance, um, as you know, we are at the moment in the final stages of, uh, of the, preparing the strategy. It should come out uh, hopefully uh, early February together with the 2040 climate target plan. And in both communications, it's very clearly indicated that without CCS, CU, CCU and carbon removals, uh, industrial carbon removals, we will not be able to achieve the 2040 or 2050 targets. So this is uh, clearly a very um, important element uh, of the, the whole uh, going forward of the climate uh, policy of the European Commission of the European Union. Uh, this is also why these three elements together, of course, with the CO2 transport infrastructure, which is a key enabler for all the, the industry, uh, will be the, 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 the main uh, part of the, the strategy. And I think this kind of discussions, as we had today, shows also very clearly, uh, and not only because we are at the end of the mandate, not at the beginning, why we cannot yet come with a regulation or a directive or whatever legislation on this, because there are so many unknowns and open questions still on how a regulatory framework could it should look like. Um, I mean, we are at the moment, um, of course, as you know, through the uh, CCS forum, but also for other uh, means trying to actually gather uh, information on what kind of regulatory framework would be the most appropriate for this industry. And I think the commissioner said it very clearly in Olborg. On the one hand, we need to have a, a regulatory framework which is stable, which ensures um, uh, non-discriminatory access to the infrastructure where needed, uh, which uh, needs to also ensure uh, transparency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the usual, I call it regulatory principles. On the other hand, and again, she underlined this, underlines this every time she talks with the industry as well. We do not want to stifle competition, obviously. So this will be a very difficult balance to also uh, find for us. Uh, therefore, I mean, meetings like the one of today uh, and also meetings we had already in the past and will have uh, in the future um, will uh, obviously help us to find uh, the, the relevant um, or how do you say that the, the necessary depth of such a regulatory framework and maybe also show us that this is not needed. We are going to do already some things which we can do without the legislative proposal, like looking at the standards, uh, how should standards look like. There we already see from the industry very different uh, positions coming, whether it is from, for example, um, infrastructure operators or whether it's the industry itself. So we are working uh, together. We will be working in the coming months already with the European standardization bodies to get this work uh, off the ground uh, very quickly. So I think there's a first element already on the table. 
And the second thing, which also colleagues are already starting working on in parallel to finalizing the strategy is actually network planning. So how can we actually make sure that all these elements, which many of you have raised, when it comes to uh, the infrastructure, when it comes to the infra to the CO2 network, that this is actually developing in a coordinated way. And that coordination is ensured between the different elements of the network so that, um, as uh, Christopher said it in his pres uh, presentation, X, Y, Z and Alpha actually know what's coming and how these will work together. So the idea is we will have um, a strategy, hopefully in the coming weeks. I mean, our planning is still to have it adopted at the, on the 6th of February, as many of you probably have seen uh, from the um, preview of the commission. So this is our target. So I hope that we will have an interesting process until then. And hopefully that this uh, strategy will then also kickstart further discussions on the more detailed uh, implementation of uh, the CCUS strategy, uh, carbon management strategy, uh, or whatever terminology you would uh, want to use. I think both of them are still very much used. So we're looking forward to having discussions with all of you or with all stakeholders on the more detailed uh, regulatory framework over the next months. And um, then uh, so that this can go into a very in-depth uh, impact assessment, which always is asked from us. And then we'll come up with a legislation as soon as the new college will uh, enable us to do so. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to all the discussions. Thank you, Edith, and thank you for openness and uh, really proposing the partnerships of, on these issues. Um, um, what remains from me, I would just uh, as a, just make more precise timing that on the, the steps on the societal trust uh, seminaries on 24th of January, as I, I discovered now in my my inbox, uh, these are the study results being discussed. I think it is important issue, but there are all other issues and not less important. So I believe that uh, uh, everybody who really believes in Europe's industrial future really need to put all the minds together to find the most uh, the optimal solution for the issues that we are facing. It's not so much about why do we need to this, but really how to do this. And that I think is the issue that uh, some fine tuning, some have still need to be done, but we still have a time and it's better to do it right than to do it extremely fast and later on discover that it does not work. So that will be by far more difficult. So I believe that there we should have some indulgence. It should be done correctly and uh, that it serves a purpose, not just something that later on we need to redo it. And with this, I would like to thank the panelists. You have been excellent. I would like to thank also Edith. Thank you for attending. Uh, definitely, uh, Christopher will follow and uh, perhaps will write another article on the basis of today's discussion. And uh, with this, I could conclude. And thank you for audience. I apologize that we have not had a chance to answer all the questions, but I made aware the panelists that they will look on the questions and there will be many other debates where these issues will be erased. Thank you. And well, as I started today, have a nice and good year in front of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.